Happy politics, and welcome to what I know is your favorite podcast. This is BC Poly Hot Stove. My name is McLean Kay. I'm the editor-in-chief of The Orca, and this is my living room. And yes, that is a Brachiosaurus. I'm joined in a more socially distant manner by... Uh, it's uh, Jordan Bateman, uh, Vice President of Communications, Independent Contractors and Businesses Association. And I am here in beautiful Burnaby, British Columbia, Canada. Is it beautiful today? Is it? What no, is it? it's kind of cloudy. It's, it's okay, mediocre at best. Mediocre. At mediocre. Best. <laughs> mediocre. Well, we won't. We won't call it mediocre, Burnaby. It's a beautiful place. That's right. Um, look, we're going to start this week with an issue. Uh, speaking of the beautiful place where you live and work, yeah. uh, it's been some. It's been a rough week. Um, there's been some ugly headlines, the worst kind, really. Um, shootings at a mall and uh, an arena. Mm -hmm. um, it's the specter of gang violence seems to be uh, well it never really went away but um it's it's certainly ramped up in the last couple of weeks um and as somebody who lives in the area jordan i mean how are you feeling right now yeah well a little nervous to be honest so uh, two malls actually one in on the surrey delta border right. uh, scottsdale a corrections officer was shot there um, and then uh, a shooting at willowbrook mall in langley which you know every langley kid knows is our local mall um or out front of Sport Check and Toys R Us, stores that we've been in many times as a family. And then a shooting outside, a, a murder, a gang hit outside uh, Langley Sportsplex. You know, I was at Langley Sportsplex twice a week all year for the kids' hockey. Um, you know, very public places, places where we're very fortunate that um, these idiots didn't miss uh, and hit someone innocent. I, I'm not sure about the Willowbrook one yet. I haven't heard if that was, I, I hope it's not an innocent bystander. I don't want anyone to get shot, but certainly yeah. not innocent bystanders. But it all comes down to this ongoing gang war that's going on, apparently. And it just struck me as I was you know, watching it unfold on Twitter, yet another shooting at Willowbrook yesterday, that the NDP government have been suspiciously silent about all of this. And uh, you know, I know that a number of media outlets follow me on Twitter, so I was beseeching them to uh, make sure that they put this on the Premier's agenda this week uh, during their questioning, because you know, <laughs> not good to what about ism in politics, but what about this? Back in the day when they were in opposition, these kind of issues, uh, the NDP made a lot of hay on politically. They would have savaged the uh, liberals for not acting and not doing enough to uh, stop gangland violence. Um, you know, think about money laundering and all the mm -hmm. blame that the liberals got for that. And now it seems to be like, hmm, maybe the liberals didn't, you know, mishandle that too badly. Maybe there was other things involved. But it all comes down to, um, Listen, clearly something is crazy is happening uh, on the gang front. Do the police have enough resources? Should they be getting more resources? And instead of talking about idiotic things like unrandom checks and uh, you know health region crossings and tying up frontline police resources, doing essentially Corona Karen bullying, can we address <laughs> the real issue here, which is? People are getting shot at Willowbrook Mall. <laughs> like, this is a public safety issue. This is number one. This is why police go into the policing business to stop these things from happening. Can we focus ourselves a little bit on something other than, uh, you know, this, the COVID uh, outbreak? Um, please, I'm begging you and I'm begging the media to, you know, really get this on John Horgan's agenda because clearly these new uh, NDP MPs aren't doing it. Uh, clearly, the South Fraser MP, NDP MPs that brought them to power, or MLA, sorry, aren't doing much. Yeah. Let's get this on the agenda and let's get some resources. And I want to find out what are you doing about it? Because all we've heard so far about the NDP and gang uh, issues is when they cut the funding to a major program in Surrey that was designed to help prevent kids from going into gangs in the first place. Not good enough. Let's hear your plan. Now's the time. Yeah, it, it has been kind of a curious silence uh, from Victoria on this. I mean, not even a, you know a, a statement from the premier's office saying he deplores violence, which you know takes ten minutes to send, but at the very least is an expression that they're aware of the problem. Um, but yeah, other than it coming up last week, um, with you mentioned the uh, the road checks, which we're not calling road checks, and someone asked Mike Farnworth um, if they would be taking resources away from the fight against gangs, and he said no. But I mean, that was literally answered no. So. I I mean, <laughs> things have gotten worse since then, and so we'll see what the what the government comes up with. Um, I'm not sure when the premier will be meeting with media this week. Um, I don't haven't seen an advisory yet, but I mean it's only Tuesday, um, and it usually it happens on a Wednesday or Thursday. So we'll see. Um, I can't imagine this will not come up. 
Uh, but, I mean, we can only ask so many questions about uh, road checks between, what is it, on the, at the ferry terminal. So hopefully yeah. uh, this subject um, will come up because, you know, people are dying. Sh shootings at malls and arenas is not something that people expect uh, in this province, nor should they. No, and look, this is, you know, suburban, greater Vancouver. This is, you know, it's just a matter of time before one of these jackasses misses their intended target yeah. and someone innocent gets hurt. God forbid a child, well, anyone innocent gets hurt in this. So what are you doing about it? What's your plan? And how are you making sure that the police have every resource they need? I know Mike Farmer spent weeks, two weeks apparently, working out the not-so-random, random checks, uh, <laughs> counterpoint checks. Um, we don't have two weeks on this. These shootings are now happening on a daily basis, and then they, you know, someone steals a car and burns it out as kind of a sign that, yeah, this was actually our gang doing it. This is escalating. How are you going to stop it from escalating further? That's what I want to know. And, and that's what, frankly, friends, neighbors, Facebook groups in Langley, I can assure you, this is discussion number one. It's even broken through the COVID malaise uh, that is, uh, or the COVID fascination, compulsion, obsession that has gripped us for a year and a half here or 13 months, 14 months, just feels like a year and a half. This is a public safety issue number one in Langley, and we want to know how it's going to be addressed. There is no clever or funny seg from gang violence uh, into anything, so I'm not going to try, and I'm just going to say we'll move on to the next topic. Uh, this is a subject uh, that I feel uh, is a little more in our wheelhouse because nobody's dying, mm -hmm. um, and that is the issue of uh, subsidies uh, for political parties. Uh, these were introduced after the last, uh, sorry, not the last election, the 2017 election, the last, last election, and was supposed to be a transitional measure, but it looks as though that expiry date, uh, much like some of the tents and parks here in Victoria and elsewhere, uh, that deadline will not be met. It's shocking. Yes. Does anyone really believe a politician is ever going to vote not to put money in a politician political party's pockets? Of course not. Um, this file has been dotted by, frankly, outright broken promises and lies from the beginning. He was asked point blank in the 2017 election campaign, John Horgan, will you fund political parties? I would never fund political parties and how dare you ever accuse me of that, Christy Clark? That is not on the cards at all and I will never do it. Fast forward, mm, three months, six months, big checks being stroked by guess who? Taxpayers to political parties. Now I have a very fundamental um, uh, ideological concern and issue with this. Uh, I do not believe, look, the state, if you don't pay your taxes, the state takes everything you own and puts you in jail. Yes. That comes with a moral responsibility to the taxpayer, that we're not gonna waste your money on stupid things, uh, self-serving things, like, you know, there's a sacred trust between taxpayer and government, or there should be. And when you're taxing the single mom who's scrimping to make ends meet and you know working two jobs in order to provide for her family, when you're taxing uh, that individual and then handing that money over to a New Democratic Party uh, Inc. so that they can run, you know, so that David Eby can have a podcast lashing Kevin Falcon before he's even a candidate, so that they can run negative ads and vice versa. If you're giving it yep. to the BC Liberals so they can run, you know, John Horgan Pinocchio ads, they didn't, but they should because the guy <laughs> broke a lot of promises. Um, you know, that is not why people pay taxes. People pay taxes mm -hmm. for healthcare, for, you know, roads, for you know, school, those kind of things. Not so that politicians can get reelected, not so that political parties can, you know, Buffer the, you know, buff it up their brand. That is not why people pay taxes, and I have a fundamental problem with that. It goes even further. Like, there are people willing to stroke checks out of their own free will and to get the tax credit to these political parties. So we're actually telling them not to, and we're taking it on as taxpayers. Like, this is the big priority. And John Horgan, tut tut, said, oh, it's only been thirty million dollars. Thirty million dollars. You don't think that would come handy in the fight against gang crime right now? $30 million, that's about two elementary schools. $30 million, that's a high school. That is a mm -hmm. significant amount of money that could have been spent on, you know, real priorities, not on negative advertising by partisans. Um, it just, it, this one drives me crazy for a whole bunch of reasons. Yeah, I mean, in, a lot of people look at this from the angle you just did, which is, you know, if you're a, a BC Liberal supporter, you don't want your money going to the NDP or the Greens, or, and again, vice versa, if you're a Green supporter, you don't want your money going to the BC Liberals or NDP, but the other people we're forgetting about here are the uh, 
what, call them 45 to 40% of British Columbians who don't vote for anybody and uh, d apparently don't think much of any of the parties. Um, I can't imagine this will go over well in those places uh, either, because, I mean, if, if their voting inclination is a pox on all their houses, yeah. uh, it's a pretty far leap to then go to a tax on all their houses. Man, <laughs> McLean, if I was still the Taxpayers Federation, I'd get a big billboard made up that looks like the British Columbia, your tax dollars at work thing, and I would have $30 million on it, and I would go in front of NDP World Headquarters, wherever the hell that is in Vancouver, and put it up and have a media event and say, this is your tax dollars at work, taxpayers. Is there something we could have spent $30 million on? Maybe vaccines? Maybe PPE? Maybe more contact tracers? Maybe more police shutting down airports? Like, there's lots of things we could have spent that money on. I, I hate it. Here's the other thing. If you're a grassroots, uh, let's say you're a nonpartisan person out there and you just want more choices at the ballot box, yeah. you are actually suffocating um, upstart parties from, from getting a chance because yeah. immediately they start, they already start with a huge disadvantage, a new party uh, compared to the established ones. Now you're starting them with like a $75,000 deficit to the Conservative Party of BC, which is like a vanity brand for a couple of uh, you know folks and like it is not fair and, and so we're actually basically saying well we just want the NDP the BC Liberals the Green Party and I guess you know a couple other little tiny parties that happen to get a few bucks here and there that's all we want for choices in BC don't don't start up a yeah. new party it is an unfair advantage at a time where incumbents already have a massive advantage. Um, you know, based on every survey that's ever been done of, of political stuff. So um, I, I don't like that. My, my fundraising thing is very simple, McLean. Uh, like if I were writing fundraising laws for elections, it would be very simple. Seven days before every election, there would be a blackout period. And no one would be able to take a donation from the point seven days before an election until, you know, six months after. And on that seventh day before the election, every party, every candidate would be forced to produce a list of every donor and how much they gave. And if Peter Armstrong, he always the one who kind of gets you know, thrown around a lot, gave $923,000 to the NPA party in Vancouver one election, uh, I would like to know that before I go and cast my ballot. Because yeah. I would like to think like, oh, so Peter Armstrong gave that much, he must really believe in these guys. You know, like, what, you know, what does that mean? Yeah, for good or bad. Yeah. And also, like, not to make every argument on the internet about Nazis, but if a neo-Nazi is giving money to a political candidate, I don't yeah. really care if it's 50 bucks or 500 bucks or 5,000 bucks. I just want to know what candidate is getting that money from a neo-Nazi so I can vote their asses out. So yeah. that, like, to me, is, makes much more sense. And then you're not, taxpayers aren't footing the bill for it. And if a corporation or a union or a special interest group gives money, you can go and say, geez, why is the Teachers Federation giving this particular candidate, you know, X, X thousands of dollars? I wonder what, the, you know, I wonder what's going on there and let people make that decision for themselves. Uh, I, on this one, you and I agree. I, uh, it has been, I mean, we have already kind of forgotten, you're right. We went from this will not happen to it is just a temporary measure, a transition measure to, uh, <laughs> we'll see. So, yes, I guess we will see. And speaking of fundraising, um, we got um, federal fundraising money uh, for the first quarter of uh, this year. Mm -hmm. And there's some surprising numbers there, Jordan. Okay, so what's the media narrative been for the past, uh, since January 1st, uh, federally? There's been two. Number one, spring election, the liberals are going. Yeah. Number two, Aaron O'Toole can't even keep the Conservative Party together. The grassroots are out to kill him, and they are fed up with Aaron O'Toole, and the whole thing's going to fall apart because he embraced a carbon thing. Yeah. <laughs> like, not, it's a weird he's, plan. He's but had whatever. some stumbles. That's, yes, yeah. yes. And so that is the measure. So we've been waiting for a measuring stick. Prove this. And the polling's kind of been static, and nothing really has happened. Well, we got Q1 fundraising results. The CPC, Conservative Party of Canada, raised $8.5 million in Q1 alone. The Liberals raised $3.5 million. That's a $5 million head start advantage for Aaron O'Toole. So you tell me, McLean, how pissed off the uh, grassroots of that party is if they've out fundraised the Trudeau Liberals, who apparently everyone loves so much they can't wait to reelect the guy, by $5 million. That is a shocking, staggering amount. Yeah, it is. I mean, 
both those words. It is shocking and staggering. In fact, when you sent, I hadn't seen this before you emailed me this morning. And my first response was to think, well, there's a number wrong here. Because I, I mean, I'm not, it's not shocking to see the, you know, an opposition party out fundraise the go a governing party. But as you say, I mean, this is more than double. That's, mm -hmm. it's quite astonishing, actually. Yeah. Uh, you didn't mention the NDP in uh, third place with 1.6 million. Um, that's not as crucial for them. I mean, they're, they get supports elsewhere and they have a significant um, boots on the ground advantage with some things like the, um, with some of the unions that come out to support them. That said, it's, you know, a pretty distant third place. Um, we'll see. You're right. The media narrative on Aaron O'Toole has been that he is, what? What's the word? Um, I don't want to say the word failure, but pretty close to it. Mm -hmm. And he has had, I mean, he has had some stumbles. He has yeah. had some own goals. This is, there's no getting around that, but it's not like the, uh, the liberal government has bathed itself in glory in the past couple of weeks. And so, yeah, we'll see. Mm -hmm. I, I think that this, I do not think this is the reason why this fundraising happened, but the furor that has erupted over this, um, and I've forgotten the bill number, the bill that has to do with social media regulation. Yeah. That is one where, as somebody who has a history with the Liberal Party, I am baffled. Mm -hmm. um, I do not see the appeal to the average Canadian there. Um, I, I have struggled with this because I genuinely want to understand that point of view, um, as I do with most things, and I'm, I don't get this one. And it's such an easy thing to um, spin, if you like, as regulating social media, which in effect it would do. Yeah. Um, and so the reason I'm bringing this up is um, these fundraising numbers probably don't reflect this issue. The next quarter might. Yeah. No, you're, you're exactly right. Um, a couple points. We talked Liberals, NDP, add in the Bloc, add in the Greens. They're still, all together, combined, those four parties are two and a half million bucks down to, yeah. the, uh, to the Conservatives, which tells you just the incredible advantage they have. That bill is not reflecting these numbers because that's been an April issue. This is Q1. And you're right. Um, I think you know, fundraising is going to go up, especially since it's a core free speech value. Um, you know, Even some of those social conservatives who are very disappointed in Aaron O'Toole, they're going to mm -hmm. be opening their checkbook for this issue because this would curb. They know, they know who the liberals are targeting in these things, yeah. right? It's them. They're very aware. Yeah, they're very aware. And they're very well resourced and networked. And, and they're getting that message out there. I, I don't understand. Like, I don't understand what the Liberals are doing. That, that cabinet minister has been a dismal performer on this file. Um, uh, did, you, did you see that interview on CBC oh, with uh, David Common? Oh my I mean, he gosh. couldn't even articulate his point of view. It was a in the in the long history of ministerial interviews that have gone south uh, in this country in this province. That yeah. is that was high among them. Historic. That was, uh, Michael Geist is kind of the expert on Twitter on these sort of free speech issues and, and regular internet issues. Uh, the liberals have completely lost him. <laughs> like when you, and this is a guy who was pretty pro Trudeau when Trudeau came in and very anti Harper as far as some of the draconian measures there. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, it, 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 you know, we're at a point now in history, and I think. You know, the liberals look south and thought to themselves, oh, you know, this was mm -hmm. popular with the kind of the Biden Democrat world and Hillary land uh, because Donald Trump obviously used social yeah. media as an advantage and blah, blah, blah. Um, Trump lost. Uh, <laughs> Biden won. And yeah. thus proving that social media is not some sort of magical bullet that can, you know, slay any dragon and help you overcome any election odds if you're just unscrupulous enough. And God knows Trump tried, but it didn't, you know, it wasn't enough. So let's get past that. You know, yeah. Trump didn't win in 20 whatever, uh, 2016 because of social media or Russian intervention. He won because Hillary was a terribly flawed candidate and he did a better job of talking to blue collar workers in four key swing states. And he lost because he lost those voters <laughs> over the you know, yes. ensuing four years. <laughs> For a collection of reasons. Yeah, exactly, but yes. exactly. Yes. So like this kind of weird woke left conspiracy theory that, you know, social media somehow is, you know, like, there's pros and cons of social media, but, you know, we can talk about all of that. It, this bill clearly overreaches. Um, the Liberals should retract it. And I see now the NDP are voting against it. I haven't done the math whether the NDP and Conservatives have enough, or if, I guess they probably still need the block as well. I think they do need the block. Um, and the block have been quietly supportive on this one because obviously they have a very different, very different take. Two, two things about this issue uh, leap out at me. And the first is that there are those, because you're quite right. I mean, the, the unspoken 
uh, target of all this is, you know, the, the right wing organizers, the, the people that are, are were on parlor until, you know, okay. whenever that yeah. <laughs> does that even still on? I don't even know. I don't know. But um, the problem is, is that for those people who think that that will only ever be the target, you have to anytime government gives itself more control, you have to imagine that control in the hands of your opponents. And so for federal liberals, I mean, imagine Stephen Harper giving himself power to regulate social media, you would have lost your minds, and yep. rightfully so. Yep. Uh, and so that, that's what you have to think. The other thing here is the one thing that the federal liberals have been very good at um, under this government and others, but I think especially this government, is abruptly reversing course and acting like it never happened. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and that hasn't happened here, but it's something that they've done well on occasion. It's, it, that to me is suspicious because it is so, to me, it seems like such a bad issue for them. It's such a, they're so out of step, I think, with how most people feel about the internet and, and social media that it would cost them nothing to just say, oh, we never intended to do that. That was, you know, how, you know, that's yeah. that only, a, only a right winger would suggest that. They've been very good at that. And so far, they haven't done it yet. Yeah, it's a weird, it's such a weird issue for them. I don't know what their numbers are telling them about why they should hang on on this or what they see as being the ROI. But look, there's lots of, things government can do right now let's do something else yeah. <laughs> like uh, let this one go folks i could not agree more um the weekly segment uh, we actually have some sort of news this week and that is uh jordan gives us updates on the bc liberal leadership contest that there's news in that um we now have well we had two official candidates all mm -hmm. along but uh the uh ellis ross who was the first is now also uh, he has his website he has done a more formal campaign launch um have you had a chance to look through it? And, uh, hey, and is there any other news we should know about? I've not looked at the Alice Ross website, but uh, welcome, Alice, officially to the race. Uh, um, I think a lot of us are waiting to see who goes next, and there's a little bit of a <laughs> staring contest. Um, yeah. I know Renee Merrifield took a few hits on Twitter last weekend over mm -hmm. um, her steadfast support for vitamin D. <laughs> McLean, I would just like it on the record, I support all the vitamins equally. Um, vitamin C, <laughs> vitamin A, vitamin D, they are all very important. Riboflavin, whatever yeah. that is. Riboflavin, I, I remember that's a word I learned in school that I haven't used since. Uh, so uh, that kind of shows you, though, that um, the NDP are paying very close attention to Renee um, mm -hmm. and are more than happy to unleash certain media hordes upon her to when uh, things go awry, um, certain uh, social media hordes as well. So. Um, that tells you that, uh, like, I, I see Renee as a very um, high floor, high ceiling candidate. Like, I think she's, yeah. I think she's building up a very good team and, and a smart, um, a, a very smart brand going forward. Um, Alice, Alice is such, like, Alice is so different from everyone else in the race. And you know, it's not, not because he's indigenous, but just the story he can tell. Yeah. And the per, his perspective, well, I guess it is because he is indigenous. The perspective he has on the world is so unique and so different. He sees BC, um, he's seen the worst and the best of British Columbia, and, and especially echoed in his relationship with uh, the indigenous peoples. And that is, I think, going to be, he, he's very important to have in this race because British Columbians, and particularly ones on the center right, we need to talk about these issues. We need to talk about um, you know what indigenous reconciliation looks like, um, you know, in our political framework and, and philosophy. We need to talk about what partnering with indigenous bands looks like as far as creating economic prosperity for British Columbia and for them. Um, and he can do that in a way that obviously no one else can in this race. And I'm excited he's in. I think he's going to bring a lot to the debate stage. I think he's going to. Um, I think he's he's a definite contender. Like he's he's got a little bit of that John McCain straight talk express to him, and like that is well McCain proved a very powerful tool. So um, I, I'm looking forward to seeing more from Ellis in the coming days, and I will be heading to his website as soon as I get off this call to uh, to take a look. <laughs> I mean, it's a website. It's it's. <laughs> It's there. Um, that's not a criticism. I just mean there are no there are no fireworks. It's it's uh, it's a pretty standard campaign website. Again, not a criticism. Uh, Gavin Dew has been taking advantage of his well being sort of the first horse in the race. Yeah. Uh, making some news by calling for a public inquiry on um, the COVID response in this province. Um, it's I I think that's the kind of thing we'll all want to know. Now mm -hmm. when people hear public inquiry. 
they tend to think witch hunt, which yeah. does happen on occasion. Um, I was thinking more in terms of line, along the lines of were we prepared enough? What could we have done differently? You know, surely we'll want to learn lessons when this is all over without pointing any fingers. Um, I, it seems like in, in, without it becoming a witch hunt, as I was saying earlier, I think this is it's an obvious thing that we yeah. would most jurisdictions would want to do, would they not? I, I would hope so. Um, you're right. Like, uh, look, there's going to be certain decisions that are relitigated. Of um, course. You know, rapid tests, I think, is an obvious one. Um, why didn't we deploy them sooner or at all? <laughs> <laughs> like, we have these tools and they're just sitting in a warehouse somewhere, I presume, in Victoria gathering dust. Um, you know, the decision had long-term care was dealt with in the early days. Uh, but yeah, look, uh, history is going to repeat itself if we don't learn from it. Absolutely. And, absolutely. You know, we learned a few things, even though it was 100 years ago, from the Spanish flu of 1918. Wash your hands. Think of the early days advice. It was, it was like reading a newspaper of the 1918, right? Wash your hands, wear a mask, you know, avoid others. A social distance, although they didn't use that term. Um, we owe it to future generations to do the same hard look at what we did um, and leave a roadmap for them um, and protections going forward. Like, the federal government is the one who should be quaking in their boots on this because they clearly bungled yeah. vaccine um, uh, procurement. They clearly bungled, they threw out millions of pieces of PPE in the months before the, the outbreak. Um, so they were keeping PPE supplies up to date. Um, the pharmaceutical industry was chased out of Canada and we've you know, been uh, frankly vicious towards them um, for years, uh, hostile in our uh, regula regulation and in our uh, public statements. Um, let America handle that. Um, oh, isn't it terrible? America is owned by the pharmaceutical companies. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I can, give me some of that. I'd be happy to have that right now. Um, so there's lots federally, but there's definitely, you know, the bottom line is the federal government doesn't deliver healthcare service. The provincial governments do. I think every province owes it to future generations to take hard looks at the decisions and the preparation and make sure that we're leaving things in place for future generations so we can hopefully avoid a 15 month economic disaster, um, thousands of people dying, um, hundreds of thousands of people being sick. Um, we, we need to find a way to avoid that in the future. Yeah, and even if it's, you know, even if some of the recommendations seem obvious now that we just might not, not, not think of in 50 years, like keeping a strategic reserve of PPE mm -hmm. on hand and up to date, I mean, that, that's just one off the top of my head. And again, it's not about pointing fingers at the people who had to make decisions in real time as information changed every day. It's not about that. It's yeah. just about surely there are lessons to learn from how things happened here and elsewhere too, not just BC. Mm -hmm. Every province, every country, I think, is going to want to at least look at what happened and what they did well and what they didn't do well and ask themselves yeah. why. That's, that's just yeah. common sense to me. And when some of these resources aren't being spent chasing down current cases, you can go back and look at trends. Like yeah. what happens if we discover 40% of all the cases came via the airports? Well, that's gonna shape what we do in the future, right? Like mm -hmm. we've allowed, we're still allowing international flights to land. That should probably stop in the future if that's the case um, in, during a, a massive pandemic. So there's lots of things to, to discover there. I'm hopeful that um, my sense is Dix is probably confident enough in his response that he'd be willing to have yeah. a hard look for it. Um, he doesn't get me as being kind of the insecure. He's not David Eby. He's much more secure in who he is and, and, and what he brings to the table. Um, so I, I do think that uh, he'd be more willing to do that. Um, you know, Dr. Bonnie, I'm not, it's not really her decision. It, no. you know, it's one of the few powers the provincial health officer doesn't have is to call inquiries. But it's, it's definitely, we, we, have to get yeah. to, we have to see if there's a better way of doing this. And to prove out certain things too, look, yes, young people have gotten sick. Um, transmission through schools has been a big talking point on Twitter for a long time. Did it actually occur? What are the cases? You know, sh you know, how does that affect uh, pandemic planning going forward? That's all stuff we need to know. Yeah, and again, I, I think the, the the key here is not to overreact to the word inquiry, and maybe there's a better word, yeah. maybe commission or something like that, because yeah. inquiry does have a slightly you royal know, commission on. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, something like that. Yeah. Because look, you're right. And Gavin, you know, good on Gavin for bringing it up. It's a little bit of a. Well, duh, you know, but he was the first one to mention it from yeah. that side and he got some press for it. And that's what he's got to be doing right now is finding ways to uh, to stay into the, not so much the public consciousness, but in BC Liberal members' consciousness. Yeah. Now, um, 
as we wrap up, I'm going to uh, take advantage of my my pulpit here and kick around a column that I am considering and I haven't thought all the way through yet. And so I'm going to talk it through live with you Mm -hmm. and I guess our listeners as well. And my feeling is that we're actually in for a pretty rough summer here in Canada and BC specifically. And the reason for that is um, we like to compare ourselves largely to two countries. um, And I'm making huge, broad sweeping generalizations, the UK and the US. The U.S. is at the point now where anyone who wants a shot can walk into a Walmart with no appointment. Um, the U.K. is already having mass events. Um, the U.S. is getting there, and you know by the summer, it's only what May the fourth today. May the fourth be with you. Um, by this summer, there will be. That's right, May the fourth be with you. Yeah. That's gonna and annoy also everybody. with you, my son. <laughs> <laughs> that's gonna piss off everyone. Can't wait. Uh, but by the summer, there's going to be full, you know, yeah. full stadiums of baseball games. There's going to be concerts. There's going to be biker rallies. There's going to be, yeah. you know, people on beaches. And good for them, and I'm happy for them. But Dr. Bonnie hinted yesterday that that just will not be the case here in, in BC. And again, just like when we're talking about the inquiry, it's not about blame. That's not the point here. But it is going to be very difficult to watch things unfold uh, like life is going back to normal in the U.S., and that will not be the case here. It's not clear. I mean, we're, we're talking about things like baseball games. That's not happening this summer, but it's not clear that we're going to be allowed to travel to see our parents <laughs> and hug them, much yeah. less go for a baseball game. And so yeah. I feel like some of that steam that has been building up, the summer is going to be hard. Um, you know, we're already seeing things like protesters blocking bridges, and I'm not drawing a parallel there. I'm just saying there's going to be things that are contributing to day-to-day frustration, and we will not have the release of... Canada Day fireworks, yeah. um, all that kind of thing, uh, or even just you know planning on travel. I mean, are you going to have a summer vacation this year? What is that going to look like? And so, I haven't quite mapped this out in my head yet. But my feeling is, as I talk it through live here with you, is that this is going to be a difficult summer um, because last year it was new and we were we were all in it together. And by we, I mean the world. And this year we're going to feel a little left behind, which may not be fair because other places in the world were, were much further ahead. I mean, God, look at India. But we do like to compare ourselves to the United States because we watch their media every single day. And we also look down our noses at them the last 10 months. And so, yeah, come June, there's going to be a lot of very bitter pills to swallow watching full crowds at Mariners games. Yeah, well, the Dallas Stars have announced they're bringing back crowds. Yeah. So um, my wife, it's funny you mentioned this, mentioned this, because my wife and I were talking about this last night. And a year on in, in summer, a year from last summer, last summer we were a little bit ahead as far as openings go compared to yeah. other jurisdictions. Now we're going to be farther behind, one presumes. But I think the problem for uh, the public health establishment is if you don't give people more freedoms this summer than they had last summer, people are going to be absolutely pissed off because yeah. you're claiming that a third of us have been vaccinated, which isn't actually true. A third of us have had one dose and apparently a big chunk of that are the people like you and I who had the, uh, the Walmart version of the actual fancy uh, <laughs> yes. of, of it. Um, you know, yes, millions of doses are arriving in Canada apparently this month, although we've heard that before. Um, but you know how quickly does that roll out? How you know very, very, very like ridiculously few people have had a, their second shot, and thus are quote unquote fully vaccinated or as fully as they can be. Um, they've already stretched the time in between those shots, so they're not as effective as if they had been done according to the manufacturer's specifications. So yeah, a year later, like if you don't feel like you have more freedom than you did last July, people are going to find that very difficult. You're going to see a lot, well, you're already seeing a lot of people managing their own risks in their mind, deciding what's right for them and their family and saying, sorry, like, sorry, Dr. Bonnie, like my kid has got to have a friend in their bubble who they can see, you know, every week play each other's houses and whatever. And we're vaccinated, they're vaccinated, we're willing, or for one shot each, we're willing to take that risk. You're going to see more and more of that. And that is the last thing that, you know, public health wants because, they want firm control over all this and the numbers yeah. will begin to creep up again. So you're not wrong. Like, I mean, it's, are it's they really going to criticizing, you know, Dr. Bonnie Henry or anyone? Not, no. not that at all. I mean, totally not. they there. It's not their fault that, you know, BC and Canada don't exist in a vacuum. And if, if yeah. things were still terrible down in the United States, I, I don't think this would be as big a deal. I just mean, it's going to be really hard. 
um, and grating to watch life go on as normal in places like Disneyland and, you know, 4th of July fireworks. And then Canada is going to have kind of another lost summer. You mentioned kids. You know, my kid has had, my kid is six. Um, he has had one friend over to our condo in the last 15 months. Yeah. Um, and has not been to another kid's place. Is that right? I mean, we're talking about a fifth of his life, right? Yeah. I mean, this that's hard. Yeah, that's, you know, there's development issues that happen. Like, that that is not good. I, I also think as America opens up, like, there's going to be more and more pull for or desire to go down there and get your get your shots, right? Like, yep. like I'll pay. <laughs> okay, what's it, what would it cost me to get Pfizer down there? 50 bucks? Great. 100 bucks? Well, they're offering it free at yeah. Walmart if you walk in. So, yeah. I mean, it, Right now, it's just the cost of a ferry ticket or whatever else, and then yeah. finding your way back. But I mean, yeah. I mean, the mayor of the mayor of Rosslyn got a bunch of crap online and had to apologize because she is a dual citizen and has family in Arizona. So she and her husband drove across the border, got a shot as soon as they did, drove down, spent a couple of weeks uh, with their family down there, got the second shot, and came back. And this is like some sort of you're a monster for going. No, you're smart. Like, yeah, <laughs> more you power are now to safer you. safer because of what I just did. Yeah, more power <laughs> to you. Like, don't apologize, Rosalind Mayor. Like, I'm I'm with you. If I had that opportunity, I do I do too. In fact, my wife and I were joking around. Like, if if Oklahoma came out with a two week tourist package, come explore beautiful Oklahoma. We'll vaccinate you on day one. We'll vaccinate you on day fourteen. And the fourteen days in between, we want you to enjoy our beautiful state mm -hmm. and everything it has to offer. Which I can't think of what that would be. Corn, maybe I don't know. Jim Ross uh, voiceovers. He's the only Oklahoma guy I know. Um, That's true. I, I'd be like, man, pack up the kids. We're going to Oklahoma. Like this sounds great. I mean, we floated this idea of vaccine tourism months ago. I think it's inevitable. I, I think people are going to start doing it. And as you've seen, a lot of people are sort of unofficially. I, I think there's going to be more and more push to just do it, especially, my God, it, how frustrating was that yesterday as somebody who did receive the AstraZeneca vaccine, then be told by um, the National Advisory Committee, which I have every reason to believe is completely credible that, well, all things being equal, it would have been better if you'd just waited for the Pfizer and Moderna. What? It reminds me. Of, it reminds me of early Excuse on. Excuse me. Yeah, it reminds me of early on where they're like, oh, "Don't worry about wearing masks. You don't need a mask." But they were only saying that because they didn't want us to consume N95 masks that were in such desperate supply in BC that bureaucrats mm -hmm. were rummaging, deputy ministers were rummaging under desks in their office looking for earthquake preparedness kits to find one or two or three masks to hand off to the Victoria hospitals. Like that is how bad it was at that time. Um, and then once Matt, once the people you know started getting cloth masks, okay, yeah, now wear masks. That's great. I, I'm an Astro, I'm an AstraZeneca person. I took it, I'm proud to have done it, you know. But you know, if I waited another few weeks, I would have gotten Pfizer, and apparently that's the one I should have waited for, according to the NACI. Yeah. Now some folks are like, well, that person shouldn't be. There, there was a tweet last night, like that person shouldn't even be on TV talking. This is a scientist, a doctor yeah. who's on the committee, the national the, committee. Na the federal advisory committee. I yeah. mean, yes, these are the people we should be hearing yeah. from. I mean, it's it, she's she may well be right. I don't know. I don't know. And I would I would rather know, even if it's very grating. <laughs> yeah. I would I would rather know if that's the case. Um, the one thing I worry about now is that you know, like you and I are both on Team AstraZeneca. There will be others who are also on Team AstraZeneca who got their shot at a pharmacy and therefore not through official government channels who will just kind of quietly say, no, I never got a shot. No, I'm, I'm yeah. here for my Pfizer. Yeah. I'm here for my Moderna. What's the worst that's going to happen? Uh, yeah. Well, I guess the worst is they could have some terrible reaction to having both. We don't know. So maybe it's good that uh, we start looking into what happens if you get you know one dose of one and one dose of the other. Yeah. Because it's going to happen. Well, exactly. So I don't know. You know... I do think government has a moral responsibility now. The next batch of AstraZeneca needs to go to people who've had the first shot. Yep. Get them up to a level of vaccination and protection that is at least comparable to having your first shot of Pfizer. Um, yep. Stop giving AstraZeneca as a first shot to people and start being like, okay, we know we said four months, but we're gonna compact it because we wanna get you as protected as possible. And you should have enough Pfizer now coming in to, to bridge the gap for other folks. But I don't get any sense they're gonna do that. No. There's, uh, this is why you need the Royal Commission, right? Because are we just making this up on the fly? In a way, you have yeah. to. But on the other hand, you, <laughs> the, first, the best vaccine, McLean, is the first vaccine you're offered. <laughs> Take the shot unless, you're offered. And, uh, unless you can Mike wait Smith. is the new advice. There's the asterisk after that sentence yeah. with unless you can wait. Yeah. Mike, you know, Smitty, Mike Smith, uh, you know, was 
radio host. It could be somewhat yeah. incendiary. He went through the roof on Twitter yesterday. He's like, what are you talking about? Because, of course, he had the AstraZeneca. And I was like, Smitty's, I'm, I'm with Smitty 100% on this. Like, what, what are we communicating out? My daughter, by the way, uh, turns 18 on May 12th. She got her Pfizer this week. She's been working frontline at a grocery store for a year. And then she's uh, working at the Langley vaccination clinic. And for three weeks in a row, at the end of the shift, she would go and they would have supply left over. And she'd be like, please, can I have uh, my shot or a shot? And they were like, no, sorry, too young, too young. You're not 18, you're not 18, you're not 18. Finally, on the weekend, she's like, guys, it's 11 days. What's going to happen? And they were yeah. like, uh, okay, we don't want to go to waste, so come on in. So she got the, as she calls it, the bougie shot, the, uh, uh, <laughs> the Pfizer, while her mom and dad are uh, suffering through AstraZeneca and, you know, are nowhere near as protected as our little uh, frontline hero. The peasant's brew that is AstraZeneca. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> but, you All know, right. she starts SFU in the fall. Um, yeah. By the way, full ride scholarship for her. Congratulations, Indy. Super proud of you. Um, and my bank account's even more proud of you. Um, <laughs> she, uh, and they're planning full, like, full classes. Like, they've been told to expect to be on campus in class like normal. Good. Yeah. So That's good. hopefully, <laughs> hopefully, yeah, I hope so. Uh, as I, when I was talking about the the summer ahead, I wasn't trying to suggest that things are all doom and gloom in Canada. Just that it's going to be hard watching uh, things get f further ahead, really, well, do, in the United States than we are. Do here. restaurants open in June? Like, are they just going to keep scheduling out? That's now, a good question. Numbers have come down, but they're still in the high six hundreds. Yeah, if, if we're down to four hundreds. Do they open the restaurants? Do they wait till school's out and then trade one risk factor for yeah. another? Are, are you, Lower Mainland resident, allowed to book travel to Tofino in June? I don't know. I have an Airbnb booked in Kelowna in August, so I better be. <laughs> <laughs> well, August. Uh, we had better by August, my God. No, that, like just at a certain point, no. <laughs> what, is, what we'll do is <laughs> I'm like traveling this August. All, the whole Lower Mainland will just empty out at once and see, just try and stop us, Farney. Try to have enough cops on the beat to stop all of us from going there to go into the Okanagan. It'll be like the sea turtles when they hatch. Yeah. And then there'll be one or two seagulls that pick off some. That's right. But the strength in numbers and most of them get to the sea. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> strength in numbers. That's a good way to end. And after comparing lower mainland residents to sea turtles, I cannot think of a... Uh, there's no better way to end this podcast. So until next week, he's Jordan Bateman. I'm McLean Kay. You're a sea turtle. Happy politics. <laughs>